Well, good morning again. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Pastor Mike. If you've been here the last several weeks, you've, you've heard him preach. We, uh, as Dan mentioned today, we're taking a little bit of a break from Romans. At, uh, it's, it's an intentional break. It's actually been marked for a while. And so when I saw that the last three weeks were going to be on sexuality and judgment day and faith and works, I said, I'm going out of town. There's, I'll come back when it's time for a softball message like Sabbath. There's a little bit of an internal joke that Mike's, Mike gets all the tough ones, and he does. <laughs> no, but we, uh, we're we going to spend probably a couple of years working through Romans, and we have intentional breaks that we're going to be taking to circle back to this uh, this idea of what it means to follow Jesus. We're calling, we're calling them the practices, following Jesus on the way. We're looking at the life and the teaching of Jesus and seeking to do what he did and to do what he told us to do. And so if, you, um, if you're if you new to New City in the last several months, this will be your first engagement with practices. There's been a decent amount of conversation there. And what I would encourage you to do is, you know, if, if you want to, you can go back and listen to some of those initial sermons. You can find them on our podcast about the practices. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And then we dove into prayer. I think there were four or five weeks there, fasting, generosity, and, um, and so we're, we're picking up the conversation with Sabbath. And so for the next four or five weeks, our Sunday morning services, the sermons will be based on Sabbath. Our sermon plus will be midweek. There's also going to be all kinds of content, recommendations, book, re- books uh, to read, maybe other sermons, some podcasts. We also want you just to be facilitating a lot of conversation. I think the practice of Sabbath, while the word Sabbath is very you know, common, it's like a known church word, The practice of Sabbath, especially for American Christians, modern American Christians, is a very foreign subject. And so what we want to do is we just want to introduce many of you to this practice of Jesus and actually this huge theme in the Bible in a way that we can have really healthy discussion, but ultimately so that you would actually make a change in your life, and you're not going to believe it, rest and delight for one out of every seven days for the rest of your life. Isn't that kind of crazy? We're, I mean, this is so good. It's so foreign, too. And it's like when you look at the Bible, you're like, oh, yeah, no, duh, I'm supposed to be doing that. It's actually madness the way that we live. And so hopefully this is like, you know, you look in the mirror being like, what am I even doing with my life? but also receiving this really gracious invitation from a generous, loving God who is for your good and for his glory, as we're just saying, and wants you to, in, to be invited into his rest and his delight. I believe that actually if we adopt this practice seriously in the coming months and years, that our lives will be radically changed. And so with that, let's, let's pray again that God would help us as we begin our time working through the Sabbath. I want to invite you to pray first as we begin. One of the things of the practices is we want to create time and space to be with God and become like Him and hear from Him. And so one of the ways that we often start our prayer and praise service is that we just kind of like, you know, lift out our hands. And if you're comfortable, you can you can do that. If not, there's no pressure. But pray something as simple as this: Lord, you are here. And I am here with you. Lord, you are here with us. And we are here with you. And just in a posture of receiving and humility, why don't you take a few moments where you are and ask our generous Father in heaven to speak to you, encourage you, and renew you today. Father, we ask for your grace, for your joy, for your peace, for your power to be known and experienced among us, your children, whom you love this morning. 
Thank you for the time already that we've had to sing and to read scripture and to pray and to give. And now, Lord, we come to your word eager, eager to hear from you, expecting you to teach us, but also, Lord, to change us. So help us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The conversation about the practices, how you live, what you're doing is, is super important because every single one of us are becoming somebody. You know, it begs the question, we, we've talked about this for over a year and a half, it begs the question, who are you becoming? Your rhythms, your habits, your relationships, the things you engage in, how you spend your time, your resources, how you engage with the world, all of these things are very active, very powerful, very influential in who you are becoming. And make no mistake, we're all becoming someone, amen? And so it's a really good question to think about, just to, for a quick moment, do a little self-inventory and be like, who am I becoming? And am I happy with who I'm becoming? The whole point of the conversations of the practices is because we're saying as Christians, we want to become like Jesus. We want to become more and more a person of love. I wanna be more patient. I want to be more kind. I want to be more hopeful. I want to be full of more joy. I want to be more forgiving and more gracious and more merciful. I want to have more peace. All of these things are who I want to be. I want to become more holy. The question is, well, are my rhythms and my habits, you know, moving me in that trajectory to become more like Jesus? And we're saying, the Bible's saying, if we want to become like Jesus, we need to be a people who do what Jesus did and follow his teaching. And so today's roadmap with this practice, the practice of Sabbath, because we believe that Sabbath is one of those practices that will help you become more of a person of love, more like Jesus, more all those things we mentioned. So today's roadmap is we're going to look at the problem, and there is a problem. You have a problem, and I have a problem. Everybody say, we have a problem. I've got a problem. There's a problem for sure <laughs> in us and around us. So we're going to look at the problem. And the second thing is we're going to look at the remedy. And this is just all introduction. And then we're going to have a brief invitation to step your toes into the waters of Sabbath and begin to dabble a little bit this week as we continue to talk. Let's talk about the problem first. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus, Jesus explains the parable of the sower. And there's one seed that he says it's the seed planted among the thorns, that he says this, the seed planted among the thorns, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. It's like, okay, those are all the things we're trying to push against. We're trying to do the things that make us fruitful, become more like Christ. And Jesus says, well, here are the things that actually choke all that out. Worries of this life, deceitfulness of wealth, desires for other things. When we could go totally, it makes sense in our culture for sure that it's taking place. Definitely in my heart at times as well. You think about it, like how do we in our culture, in our place and time, how do we typically deal with the worries of this life? How do we deal with the deceitfulness of wealth and riches? And how do we deal with the desires for other things? And put very simply, here's what we do. We never stop. <laughs> we never stop never stopping. We just keep adding more. There's more to do. The to-do list keeps going. There's another hobby. It's, you know, this is my wife's favorite thing that I say. Well, it's just a season. She's like, I'm going to kick you in the face if another season comes. It's just, it's, there's always another season, another responsibility, more pressure, more people who need us, bigger dreams, bigger ambitions, and it goes on and on and on. We're a people, it's been coined, said this way, we're a people with chronic exhaustion. And why are we so tired? Just a few factors. I mean, the modern era has radically changed our culture. It wasn't until very, very, very recently where people sleep on average like six hours a night. It used to be 10 or 11 hours of sleep. So we're literally getting less sleep than the previous 6,000 years of existence. 
There's noise pollution. There's this hurry and this busyness, this frenetic pace and increasingly slow to this modern life. And we have to keep up or we think we have to, get, we have to keep up or we're going to get left behind. There's this 24-7 work week in our culture. It's super interesting. If you read The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer does this whole history, like a quick overview of when things changed to all of a sudden Sabbath, the day of rest, whether it's Christian or not, it was built into our society where places were closed and people didn't work and you had meals together and you did hobbies and you took care of other people's needs. This was like built into the system again for thousands of years until recently and now it's, well, things are open 24-7. We're annoyed if it's not. Amen. 365 days a year. I mean, we've totally bought into this new system where things quite literally never stop. And we're in the digital age where I have access, when I'm supposed to be sleeping here, to the world that's not sleeping. The phone never stops buzzing. There's always a new movie or a new show. There's a 24-7 news cycle on social media. You're getting all of the most truth, you know, all, all of the truth about politics and storms with everybody's opinion and everybody's telling the truth. And it's just great. And it feels good and it makes you happy all the time. There's a rising cost of living. That was sarcasm in case you're not from the north. There's a rising cost of living, so people are working multiple jobs just to keep up or to keep ends meet, to you know, make ends meet. Most people are living outside of their means, which is why they have multiple jobs and are trying to keep up with the Joneses. Ronald Rollheiser says, Today, a number of historical circumstances are blindly flowing together and accidentally conspiring to produce a climate within which it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these. It is just that we are, we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. He says, we're more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. Or as T.S. Eliot says it, we live in a world now where people are distract, distracted from distraction by distraction. <laughs> We're addicted to hurry. We're addicted to busyness. And what's happening is we are quite literally starving our spiritual souls. Hurry is one of the greatest enemies of spiritual life. That's worth saying again. Hurry is one of the greatest enemies of spiritual life. There's a pastor who talks often about the practices of Jesus and there was somebody who came up afterwards and was like, listen, we've been talking about this prayer, fasting, evangelism, generosity, like, you know, service, hospitality. I want to do all these things, but like, I, I feel like I can't. So the pastor said, well, w what do you have going on? Tell, talk to me about your schedule. And he says, well, I got this, I've got that responsibility, I've got this job, I've got these kids, I've got this thing happening, I have this hobby, I, you know, I, I like to do this in my other time, blah, blah, blah. and the pastor looks at him and was like, yeah, you're just way too busy to follow Jesus. It's like, that's actually kind of the truth of our generation, our culture. People are, most of us are simply, the way we're living, simply too busy to follow Jesus the way the Bible explains it. And we think it's okay. Our busyness, our addiction to hurry, our nonstopness, because everybody else is busy too. This is just the way it is. It's the way it has to be. But the question is, what if, it's actually a disease. What if it's a contagion that's been released in our society that is actually designed to kill both our bodies and our souls? What if it goes against the very grain of God's design for creation and you and me? To push it even further, you know, what if it's sinful? Think about the highest value in Christ's kingdom economy. Love. Love. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is, love is time consuming, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 13, the very beginning, love is patient. You know what that word is? Love is long suffering. The very first explanation of love means you're going to have to put in some time. 
It believes all things. It endures all things. I mean, love is painfully at times time consuming. Therefore, hurry and love are incompatible. You cannot be a hurried person and a loving person. It's hard to love God and hard to love people when you're tired and when you're busy and when you got too much going on. You're more prone to sin when you're tired. You're less patient when you're hurried. You're more irritable when you got a lot going on. You're more selfish when you got a huge to-do list. You're more angry with people. You're more stressed. You're more worried. You're less loving. And it's kind of like, what in the world are we doing? I love this quote from Kosuke Koyama. He says, God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. But love has its speed. It's an inner speed. I love this. It's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed that we're accustomed to. It is slow, and yet it is Lord over all other speeds since it is the speed of love. In other words, there should be, there should be like this metronome in your heart. That when things arise and you go, I don't have time for it, you got to go, wait a second. Is this an act of love? Is, would this make me more like Jesus? And if so, then the other time has to be subordinate to this speed of love, is what he's saying. I mean, if you look at our lives, our chronic, chronic exhaustion, our fatigue, our busyness, our hurriedness, we have to like look in the mirror. All those things that you're feeling, all of the stress, all the anxiety, the endless to-do list, you need to look in the mirror and look at yourself and say, this is not how it's supposed to be. And I have good news. It's not how it has to be. Regardless of what class you are, regardless of where you live, there is a better way. Jesus' will for your life is not for you to be chronically exhausted and sleep deprived and unhappy and living with no margin and being ungracious to people. Jesus came, he said, that you may have life and have it to the fullest. I have a new watch because my watch of six years died on me uh, this last week. And so I was talking to some friends. I wanted, I wanted a, a watch for fitness because it you know, tells me things that it's probably lying about, but it makes me move. And um, I'm about to walk into waters where I think they're medical terms, and you're going to find out very quickly I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just aware that some of you know what these things mean, so just bear with me for a second. It tells me, like, my oxygen intake, I think, my, my heart rate, and there's, like, this variability between, you know, your heart rate is not supposed to be, like, a perfect metronome. There's, like, this variance, and it tells you a little bit about your stress. It monitors your sleep and, like, your, you know, all these different things. It tells you if you're too stressed, I get a stress score. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Again, I think it's fake. But, but here's what's super funny about my watch. I did, I, was, you know, I did not know about this feature. It pinged me yesterday because it told me that my battery was low. Not my watch battery, not my phone battery, my body battery. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, my Garmin. I'm preparing for Sabbath, where Jesus is like, hey, knucklehead, you're too tired, rest. I designed it to be that way. And I got this secular piece of silicon, or whatever it is, going, hey, your, your body battery's a little low, you need to rest. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's actually kind of like even built into our culture a little bit too. It's so funny, because they're saying, you need rest, you need rest, you need rest, so that they can sell you things to give you temporary rest. It's just crazy. My body battery is low. Your body battery is low too, friends. You need to recover. The best stuff in life comes when we're rested. I'm telling you, the worst moments of Dave Aubrey's life have been when he's been tired, overworked, hurried, stressed, too much to do. The fruit of the Spirit comes when we rest. Wisdom and insight and clarity of mind when we rest. Hope and grace for others and energy for our best work and peace comes when we are rested. And so there's a problem, amen? So we ask ourselves, is there a practice in the Bible and the way of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus that helps us reorient our hearts and our minds, move us away from exhaustion and toward life to the fullest? And the answer, oh man, do I have good news. The answer is yes, yes, and yes, and it's called the Sabbath. The remedy God has given us is the Sabbath. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2 with me. 
And forgive me that it's taken me about 15 minutes before we read a passage of scripture. Dave five years ago to slap Dave today for that. Genesis chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. You know, if I were to do a quick poll and say, what do you think the Sabbath is? What is your experience of the Sabbath? We'd get a plethora of answers. Some of you would go to the creation account, and you're like, oh yeah, it's the day that God rested after he made everything in those first six days. Some of you would go, oh yeah, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's, you know, it could be argued it's the forgotten Ten Commandments. Talk more about that later. You might say, oh yeah, I remember like Jesus arguing with people, and people arguing with Jesus because he like did something he wasn't supposed to do on the Sabbath, and didn't they make a bunch of extra rules? You might have some kind of concept, or maybe you might be like, isn't that what Jewish people do today on Saturdays? Like they, you know, they walk everywhere, and they have these feasts and candles and all that type of stuff. Or you might think, isn't it what we Christians are doing right now? Isn't this like Sabbath? It's the Lord's Day. We've shown up, and so here we are. We're Sabbathing, and the answers to all of that is like, well, kind of. We're going to spend weeks, you know, looking at the, what the Bible says holistically about Sabbath. But I want us to begin in the very, very beginning and notice a few things from our text today. Before we notice four things from Genesis chapter 2, 1 through 3, the Hebrew words, two words for Sabbath are Shabbat, which means quite literally to stop or to cease from. That's what that word means. And Nuach which means like a, a, a settling in or a dwelling place to, to take up residence. It involves settling in a place that is safe and secure and stable. And so at the very basic level, the two Hebrew words for Sabbath tell us that Sabbath means we stop from something, cease working. We rest, we settle into God's presence. That's what happens in Genesis. He, God, nuacht with us. He Sabbath with us. He dwelled with us, settled in with us. We delight, we worship Sabbath. And so if you look at Genesis chapter 2, you're going to notice a few things about the Sabbath. One is long before the Sabbath is a command in Scripture, it's a gift. Long before the Ten Commandments came, God gave and designed the Sabbath. It's a gift from the Creator to you and me and all of creation from a generous, joyful, loving God that Jesus called the Lord of the Sabbath. So it's built into, we'll we'll expand on this, the fabric of creation. God has given you the Sabbath as a gift. Two, I want you to notice that God Sabbathed. What? God stopped working. Now in part, he finished his work. Our work, in some sense, is unfinished. But the point is, God Sabbathed. Then you're like, yeah, but I'm type A. I'm a high capacity person. It's like, well, God Sabbath. You're like, yeah, but I'm more of a doer. You know, I've got a lot going on in my life right now. It's like, well, well God Sabbath. You're like, yeah, but I've got kids at home and I'm starting a business. And it's like, oh, cool, God Sabbath. God, the creator, stopped. And in doing so, he built a rhythm into the fabric of creation. We work for six days and then we stop and we Sabbath. Three, I want you to notice that God has a design for time. God created the human body and the planet itself to live in a rhythm. There's a rhythm between day and night. There's a rhythm with waking and sleeping. There's a rhythm between the noise and activity of spring and summer and the quiet and dormancy of fall and winter. There's this rhythm between the land and the sea over all the earth. Within our own bodies, there's a built-in rhythm as we inhale and exhale. And what happens is when we lose the sense of rhythm, of pace, of back and forth, we lose part of our humanity. We start functioning outside of how God designed us to function. That's the problem with us today. We're functioning outside of the way God designed for us to function. We're not machines. We have souls. (laughs) We're worshipers. We were not created to move 24-7. And when we live without Sabbath, without stopping and existing with God and delighting in Him and resting, 
we go against the fabric of all creation and we suffer the consequences. Burnout. Stress. Trashed immune systems with new sicknesses and diseases and allergies every day. Brain fog. Broken relationships. Feeling distant from God. And it's like, well, you know why, friends? We don't Sabbath. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? It's been said, it comes as no surprise that every single society, I love this, this is brilliant, every single society in the history of the world civilization has been built around a seven-day week. Here's why that's interesting. Because the seven-day week is the one unit of time that's not tied to the movement of the stars. Think about this. The day is tied to the Earth's 24-hour rotation. The month is tied to the moon's lunar cycle. The year is tied to the earth's journey around the sun, but not the seven-day week. The seven-day week is built out of God's own life rhythm. In fact, there, you know, there's stories of civilizations that have tried to move the week to 10 days, and it failed miserably. You can go read some interesting things about that. God has a design for time. You actually live within it. Civilization can't get away from it fourth thing I want you to notice is that the Sabbath is set apart from the other days. It is sanctified. It is holy. He blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Look at a couple quotes here. The first one from the Bible Project it says, the seventh day account does not end with the expected formula where if you read the Genesis account, there was evening, there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning the third day and so on. You don't find that on the seventh day. Breaking the pattern in this way emphasizes the uniqueness of the seventh day and opens the door to an eschatological interpretation. Literally, that's supposed to say literally, sorry. Literarily, the sun has not yet set on God's Sabbath. Here's what you need to understand about the creation account. This is pre-fall. We were meant to live forever on the seventh day. It's no evening, no morning. God finished his work and he came and he knew with us. He settled in with us. He dwelled with us. His presence, there was perfect harmony. And our work would come out of this forever rest with Jesus. And by the way, Hebrews tells us, we'll get this, I'm getting way ahead of myself. We're like on week three now. This is a foreshadowing of eternal rest. This is what God is restoring all of this chaos and hurry back to. And so it's amazing because here now in this broken, fallen world where there's corruption and there is all this work and there's pain and there's injustice and there's evil, we pull ourselves out of all of that and for one day we say God is the master of time. He's restoring all things to himself. The eternal Sabbath is gonna come one day and so I'm gonna practice eternity today. And there's some really cool stuff we're going to talk about, about what, you know, it, it, Sabbath isn't, <laughs> Sabbath isn't like just about what you're supposed to be doing, it's about who you are. And so it's like you live in the alternate, more real reality of new creation on the Sabbath. And so on Sabbath, it's like I'm choosing to see everybody the way they're going to be in glory. And I'm going to forgive you. And I'm going to give my enemy a gift. And I'm not going to be angry. And I'm not going to be irritable. And I'm not going to worry about all these things that have to happen. I'm going to practice eternity on this day because this, this day is actually what forever is going to be. It's built in the creation narrative. This next quote comes from a Jewish scholar. This phrase is so important, it's easy to miss its centrality. Just as in the seventh year of release, man desists from utilizing the land for his own business and benefit, so on the Sabbath day, he desists from using that day for his own affairs. He's in, and he, before we get any further, think of all the reasons why you don't or don't think you can Sabbath. Well, I got bills. I got kids. If I don't hustle... Other people are going to get ahead of me. I'm not going to be the best at what I do. I'm going to have to sacrifice some dreams and ambitions if I choose to rest and stop working on the stuff that i got to be working on. 
There's too many people and things and responsibilities dependent upon me. I can't. Fill it in. Whatever you might think it is. It's amazing that it says we desist from using that day for our own affairs. Watch what he says. Just as the intervals in regard to the release year and the jubilee years are determined by the number seven, so too is the number seven determinative for that recurring day when man refrains from his own pursuits and sets it aside for God. Now watch this. We're going to go halfway down. Man normally is master of his time. In other words, we're stewards of all that the Lord has given us. And he's given us this time, and he's given us relationships, he's given us abilities and gifts, and we steward all of it. And in many ways, and this is the creation account as well, he's given us dominion over these things. But it all belongs to him. So man normally is master of his time. He's free to dispose of it as he sees fit or as necessity bids him. You pull up your phone, your crazy schedule, you made it yourself. You're the master of your time. The Israelite or the Christian is duty bound, however, once every seven days to assert by word and deed that God is the master of time. One day out of seven, the Israelite, the Christian, renounces dominion over his own time and recognizes God's dominion over it. Every seventh day, renounces his autonomy and affirms God's dominion over him, not just it. In the conclusion that every seventh day the Israelite is to renounce dominion over time, thereby renounce autonomy and recognize God's dominion over time and thus over himself. I'll tell you what, if you never rest, you think way more than you ought to that this life is all about you. Keeping the Sabbath is acceptance of the kingdom and sovereignty of God. I exist for him. I ought to function the way he made me function. (laughs) His kingdom come, his will be done. Next week, we're going to look at the passages in the rest of the Pentateuch that talks about the Sabbath being a command. One of the things that God tells Moses to tell the people is to remember the Sabbath. To remember that there is a creator God, that we live in his world, and it's a good world. That there's a rhythm to creation, that we don't stop when we're finished because we're never finished like God. It's never enough. We stop when the rhythm that God built into our body says stop. (laughs) And it will always mean there's unfinished work. We remember, though, that we're not what we do or what we have or what other people think about us. We are who Christ says we are. We are deeply loved by God. Now, again, we fear stopping. I'm sure even right now the conversation is that in your head, oh, man, I, can I ever read your minds right now? <laughs> I can't really, but you know what I'm saying. You're, you're all going, that sounds amazing. <laughs> what do you want me to do? You want me to actually do it? <laughs> like, cool, God designed it. I see the value, makes a lot of sense. Sounds like it was really awesome 2,000 years ago. How on earth do you expect me to do it? And it's like, yeah, okay. That's where I want you to sit in this week. That tension right there. Just embrace it. Just live in that tension. And ask yourself the question, okay, Dave Aubrey, why can't I? What are the actual reasons I don't decide for one day to stop working and be present with the Lord and present to those people around me and not worry and not stress and enjoy God's good creation and settle in with God and his people. Why don't I do that? Why can't I do that? And I think, I think what you're gonna find is that the reasons you don't are fear, lack of trusting that God will provide and knows best, Selfishness, again, I'm not throwing stones, I'm one of you. Selfishness, selfish ambition, the list can go on and on. I don't think you're going to find one holy, set apart reason of why you can't or shouldn't Sabbath. And Sabbath is more than just a day, it really is a way of being in the world. The practice of Sabbath is a day of rest by which we cultivate a spirit of restfulness. It changes the way we live the other six days. And it's like this constant pattern of renewal where every seven days you get back to rest, you become more like Christ and you you live differently. And you become more like Christ and you live differently. And you become more like Christ and you live differently. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you what, you Sabbath for two years and look at how much you've changed. 
You're going to move from restlessness to restfulness. You're going to move from hurry to peace. You're going to move from busyness to margin. You're going to move from burnout to sustainable pace. You're going to move from noise to quiet, from distraction to clarity, from isolation to community, from grasping to gratitude. It's like, well, who doesn't want to live that way? None of those things are things you can buy. They're gifts freely given from a generous God who says, stop and rest and dwell with me. And so I want to end this morning with an invitation. And the invitation comes actually from Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28. Jesus himself says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Get rid of your yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm lowly and humble in heart. You're going to find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. See, Sabbath isn't just this abstract, aspirational idea. It's a practice. It's something Jesus himself did. And it is a practice out of which so many other great godly habits and practices will flow. It will help you become the person you want to become, the person God has called you to be. Sabbath, like all the other practices, is simply a means to an end. The goal isn't for you to come back in five weeks and say, I practice Sabbath. <laughs> Look at me. Can you believe it? I did it. It's not even to be well-rested and happy. The Sabbath is to participate in the love and life of God himself. The goal is to center your entire life around him, to live more deeply with him and in him, not just on the Sabbath, but all week long. Man, Walter Brueggemann, he said, people who Sabbath live all seven days differently. Sabbath is the beginning and the end of the week. It's not a mid-break. It's the climax. It's the alpha. It's the omega. And the beauty is God doesn't want you to live a Sabbathless life of nonstop exhaustion. You, brother, sister, you, right where you are, no matter your stage of life, no matter your class, can adopt and should adopt the practice of Sabbath. And here's all you have to do to start. You ready? This is amazing. All you have to do to start is just stop. It's just like, just Nike that joint. Just do it. For goodness sake, for the love of God and for the love of people, stop. For your soul, stop. To become more like Jesus, to be a more faithful spouse and present parent and faithful friend and servant of the kingdom of God, stop. To experience more love and joy and peace. To experience the Lord's provision in ways you never have. <laughs> Stop. It's just the first step. We're going to spend the next several weeks about what it means to delight on the Sabbath. What it means to do it with community. How to push against the world and the designs of our age. But for now, the big invitation is to wrestle this week with why you don't, why you think you can't. Consider the things we talked about this morning and then see if you can just find maybe an afternoon if you want to dabble your feet and get them a little wet. Turn off the phone. Turn off the screens. Be present with the Lord. Be present with his people. And just stop. Let's bow our heads. I want you to listen as your heads are bowed to this quote from John Ortberg. John Ortberg said, For many of us, the great danger is not that we're going to renounce our faith. The great danger for most of us is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will skim our lives instead of actually living them. 
As the Lord has spoken to you this morning, I want to encourage you, just take a few moments. This is how we're going to conclude. We're just going to pray. We're going to ask God for wisdom, for us, for him to help us trust him. The Spirit leads you pray.